Who was Jesus? Who is Jesus? That's the question. That's the question. What made him so special? What made him different than any other man in history? The records show. His birth was a miracle. His mom was a virgin and she was pregnant. He made the blind see. The deaf hear. The mute speak. He knew what was in men's minds. He knew what was in men's hearts. He knew the story of people's lives without ever having met them. He spoke with authority. He amazed teachers. He amazed everyone. He walked on water. He walked on top of the water. He could change the weather. He fed 5,000 people from one lunchbox. He brought people who were dead back to life. He loved sinners. He loved everyone. 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 He forgave sins. He never made a mistake. He never once sinned. But we judged him. We whipped and beat him. We spit on him. And we killed him. He loves us anyway. He died for us. He died so that we wouldn't have to. He paid for our sins with his life. Did I mention he loves us? He came back to life. He was dead. Then he was alive. A lot of people saw him. He is coming back. Who is Jesus? That's a big question. That's the big question. Who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? All right. Hey, I have a, uh, a message for the entire church family today. In fact, uh, they're joining us from the sanctuary and from the gym. And I want us all to turn in your Bible. Grab your Bible, and we're going to be in the book of Acts. You can get there. I'm going to set it up so it'll be a, a bit to get there. But uh, we're talking about this Jesus as opposed to, to that Jesus. And as we lean into this new year... My great hope is that we will fix our eyes on Jesus. That's the theme throughout the year. If last year was year of the Bible, this year, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now, that's not that we don't do that all the time. But this year, I want us to fixate, obsess, uh, be possessed by this one thought, and that is Jesus Christ, to know him. Because my thought is this, and in fact, I know it's true in my life, it's true in yours. The more we see him for who he really is. When we behold him, we're transformed by him. And to the degree that we really know him, really see him, we will be transformed by him. This Jesus, not that Jesus, the one that we have somehow created in our culture, the one that many people think that he is. This Jesus is a phrase that's seen throughout the book of Acts, in fact, uh, many times. And, and we see it there in first century Israel. It was in part because that was a common name, Jesus. Uh, Yeshua, uh, Joshua was the name. Not unlike John in English or maybe even still Jesus in Spanish. But Jesus was a common name, but even more so this Jesus. In other words, focusing on this one right here, not another one. It was Voltaire who said, the great uh, French philosopher, he's the one during the Enlightenment, he said that, uh, that, we've, that God created us in his image, and then we have been trying to return the favor ever since. And we've created this God, even this image of Jesus, uh, that may not be who we are confronted with in the New Testament. And so I want all of us to really humbly come before him today, this Jesus, the one that we find in the Bible, not that Jesus. Because oftentimes I think that we can, can uh, in fact, come to believe that this Jesus, or how about that Jesus, is this sanitized, safe Jesus. He pretty much agrees with me most of the time, hardly ever confronts my thoughts. Uh, he, we're, we're buddies. I mean, he's like my compatible you know, buddy. He's my homeboy. In fact, Jesus, this Jesus, is Lord of all. He does confront us. He does disagree with us. But it seems so common in our day. We think, well, this Jesus, rather that Jesus, he, he, he votes like me. He thinks like me. 
And what I want us to get our minds around, even in this election year, if you will, this Jesus is not Republican. He's not Democrat. He's not. He, I guess he's the ultimate independent. He didn't come to take sides. He came to take over the hearts of people as Lord of our lives. And so today I want us to get our minds around this Jesus, not that Jesus. That Jesus says, uh, go to church. This Jesus says, yes, no, follow me every day. That Jesus says, hey, let me help you do you. Just be yourself. This Jesus said, no, 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 die to yourself. Let me help you as you follow me every day. I'll fill you with my spirit. This Jesus says, die to yourself. See me for who I am. All for our good and to his glory. But how does this happen that we kind of lose our way? Let me offer two examples from my own experience or, or research and thoughts. One, uh, Stacy and I, years ago, we were able to go. Uh, we were on a mission trip, actually, in Italy, and then went to Rome and, of course, went to the Vatican, St. Peter's. I'm curious, how many of you across our campus, how many of y'all been there? So you could relate to this with me. It was stunning. And I, you know, as an art historian and lover of art, I was, I mean, it was as beautiful as I imagined that it would be. It was as awesome as I thought it would be. And with crane necks, we're looking at this thing. It was incredible. But Stacy and I both, as we talked about our experience there, couldn't help but ask the question, where? Where is the poor itinerant rabbi from Nazareth? seem to have been lost in the grandeur of it all. This man-made monument, it seems, to a religion that bears his name. Beautiful and awesome, yes. But how does that happen? Could it be that sometimes even in our own lives, even in our churches here, even in the global West, where, where is he? And the things that we do, are we truly uh, the church that he envisioned us to be. Are we his followers that he envisioned us to be? Or how about this? October 23rd, 1923. It was Ku Klux Klan Day at the State Fair of Texas. 160,000 people were there. Still one of the, the greatest numbers, largest attendance numbers in the history of the State Fair on a weekday. And, and, and you might know, I grew up in the, in the South... Uh, if you've seen images of the KKK, you, you've seen them in their white robes and their white pointed hats. The KKK aligned itself to Christianity. I don't know if you know this, but the, great, the grand wizard of the white knights of the KKK was Sam Bowers, known for his supposed radical devotion to Jesus Christ as Lord of his life. Their speeches, their prayers, you can still read, are replete with biblical language and the exaltation of Christ as Lord. And here in Dallas in the 20s, arguably the most racist city in America is what writing historians tell us. One out of every three people, no, white men were in the KKK and in churches across our city. How does that happen? We had 30 lynchings during that period of time, and the KKK was behind all of them. The last one in 1925, here in our city. How is it that when you see the pictures then, historic pictures, you can see them, of the KKK, there are three things they were always tied to. A radical nationalism, uh, law and order, even martial law, and Christianity. In their pictures, you see the American flag, guns, and who can forget the burning crosses as their sign. Now, they would say, no, it's a, it's a cross lighting, which they said was a fiery devotion to Jesus Christ. How does a movement like that become attached to this Jesus? And it begs the question in our lives. In my life, I've been troubled by this. How have I developed this image in my mind of who I think Jesus is? And how can I be certain that I'm worshiping this Jesus? 
that he's the one guiding my life. Not that Jesus that is the figment of someone else's imagination. How do we do it? We know that we see we're confronted with this Jesus in Scripture. We know his spirit speaks to us. We know in worship and in our lives together, we stay focused on this Jesus. And that is my role all the time as leaders in the church. We just want to point you to him because he's the one who changes our lives. He's the one who, 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 who calls us to pursue him and to bow down to him. My point is this. He is Lord of our lives. And so in Acts chapter 1, we're going to look at chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. We'll get there in a moment again. Acts chapter 1. Acts was written by Luke, perhaps you know that. So this is a sequel to his gospel. All right. In fact, the early part of uh, Acts 1, he says, hey, I'm continuing to tell the story of what Jesus has done. So in the book of Luke, we see the life or how about the birth, right? We recently celebrated the birth, always Luke chapter 2, the birth of Jesus, his life ministry, his death uh, on the cross, his resurrection. And so now we see what was, you could, you could say it this way, kind of the bodily ministry of Jesus. Now we're going to see the churchly ministry of Jesus. We're going to see the body body of Christ doing ministry while he was here on the planet, but then we're going to see this transition to his spirit coming into his people, why we're called the body of Christ, now taking the gospel to the whole wide world. So don't miss this. The church is a movement, not a building. It's the German word that we've come up with, church, which was a place. But in the Bible, it's ecclesia. It's a called out people on the move. It begs the question now. For each of us, do you come to church as an event or are you a part of the gospel movement that's taking place all throughout the world that we're a part of? So a summation of this Jesus, we're going to look at this um, later, but Acts 2, 36 says this before we get to our text. Let all the house of Israel, therefore, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, it's interesting to note, the word Lord is used to refer to Jesus 99 times in the book of Acts. Master, leader. The word Savior is used twice. The point is this, it seems we flipped it, as if he could be Savior of my life, but not Lord. Jesus came to take over your life and mine. Could it be that somehow we've, we've missed the mark? In fact, I'd say it this, this way. No, I'm going to quote uh, from Dallas Willard in his classic book, The Divine Conspiracy. Listen to this. My hope is to gain a fresh hearing for Jesus. This is the beginning of his book. Especially among those who believe they already understand him. In his case, quite frankly, presumed familiarity has led to unfamiliarity so it presumed knowledge of this Jesus. I got that. I know who he is. I, I've got all that there is to know about him. Presumed familiarity has led to unfamiliarity. Unfamiliarity has led to contempt. And contempt has led to profound ignorance. We've all heard that familiarity breeds contempt, right? This idea that an extensive knowledge of something or or a close association with someone can lead to, to kind of this loss of respect or even disrespect. And could it be that's happened in our lives? Could it be that's happened in my life to some degree? When this Jesus calls me to bow down before him, to be awed by him, to continue to call out for him to move mightily in my life. So let's look at this Jesus. Okay, let's look at this Jesus. Because what I want you to see today, real simple, this Jesus has come, this Jesus is here, and this Jesus is coming again. First, this Jesus has come. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, there's the word, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Now, let me pause there for a moment. Again, they call him Lord, but they're confused about what this means. Like, I think we can be as well. They, were, they wanted a military leader. They wanted kind of a worldly, powerful leader. Is now the time? He's resurrected. 
He's, he's about to ascend, is now when you're going to take us out of the grip, rescue us from the oppression of the Roman Empire. And Jesus is going to say, I, I got bigger things going on than that. I want to unpack this, but before we do, I must say this. Jesus has come. He is a historical man. And for all of our skeptics among us, maybe all this to varying degrees, we know about this Jesus outside of the biblical material. We call it the extra biblical material. We know that Jesus lived. We have historical records he lived. We know that he died by capital punishment through the, by the cross during the reign of Pontius Pilate. We know this outside the Bible. We know that his followers claim to have seen him after he died and was buried. We know this outside of the Bible. Now you can say, yeah, but that doesn't mean it happened. We know they then worshiped him as Lord, as God, is what one document says, on the first day of the week on Sunday. The birth of the church, you must account for the birth of the church. How about this? Transformed lives. If your life was evidence that he is alive and he's real, would you have enough evidence to prove you guilty by the people who know you? He lived. He came. He's not a magical character. He's not some new age spiritual force. He's not Star Wars force. He is the Savior, the Lord of the universe. He is God. The Logos has moved into the neighborhood, as the Apostle John says. He's he's walked among us. We are the visited planet, is what Philip Yancey says. I, I love that. He came in flesh and blood. For a couple of reasons. One, he died a sacrificial death on the cross, flesh and blood on our behalf. But he also came in flesh and blood because he showed us how we can live just like him, how to live. He was the prototype human. And so we know how to live because we look at him. But you must look at him. You must gaze on him, fixate on him. You must fix your eyes on him. And what we're going to talk about a lot as we move towards Easter, if we live a life that looks comprehensively like Jesus, practicing the way of Jesus, we become like him and we live the lives he's called us to live. We're going to talk about practicing the spiritual disciplines. In fact, we're meeting with all of our adult uh, connect group leaders uh, for lunch after this service today to talk about that. This Jesus has come. But look at this. This Jesus is here. He said, wait, wait, Jeff, I thought, I thought he was here, but he's still here. Watch this. Another articulation of his mission. He says in uh, Matthew 28, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Now, this is a mystery. But you cannot separate Jesus from God the Father, the Holy Spirit. And here in Acts 1, 8 and 9, look at this. I want you to see this Jesus has come. He's he's now given us his, his spirit that he's promised. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, our members know this passage well. Because it drives everything we do. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now, I want to pause here and, and look at this. I want you to see this diagram because I want to, I want to, I want to show you uh, through this diagram where we are. Okay, we see that Christ came. Okay, he has come. We see this in the first part of, uh, of the book of Acts. So Acts uh, one, go ahead and press, uh, keep rolling. And so he came, all right? He's come. He, he has come to us. And I want you to see then, we see then he ascends, right? He ascends. And, and we, we see then that, he, that, that we find ourselves in between his ascension and his second coming. So that's where we see 1-8, right? We're living in the in-between of his first coming and his second coming. He comes again. We see there in the latter part of this passage, verses 10 and 11. So where we find ourselves is right there in the in-between, living out the 1-8 mission. So what do we do between his first coming and his second coming? He's coming again. What do we do with that? We find ourselves living in the in-between. And so every day we're to be living out this Acts 1-8 mission, everything we do. So as Jesus lived this perfect life, 
showed us how to live out the great commandment to love God and to love others. He, he, he embodied that mission. And so now we're to do the same. And together as a church, together in our groups, as we do life together and serve together, we become this, this, uh, we embody the same. We become the body of Christ, living out the great commandment, loving God and loving others. We become the body of Christ in mob form, what love looks like in the world. Everything recalibrates back to Jesus. You see that? So let me put on your thinking hats with me for just a moment, because I'm going to describe it this way. All that we do comes back to the person, personality, mission, passion of Jesus Christ. So I could say it this way. Our Christology determines our theology. Okay, so Christology is what you believe about Jesus, what you believe about Christ, theology, what you believe about God. I'd say it like this. Look, we cannot deduce anything uh, about Jesus that we think we know about God. We must deduce everything that we know about God by looking at Jesus. This Jesus. Now, it's not to say that we don't know about God through creation, general revelation, and through other things. We, we, we do see that. We, we know, but we don't look at Muhammad, for instance, to, to see what God looks like, or Buddha, or Confucius. We look at Jesus. We can say that our theology is Christocentric. We know who God is because of Christ. We look at Jesus. We fixate on him, right? That's how we know who God is. But the problem for many of us is that we're not in the scriptures. We're not in his word. And again, we may presume familiarity. I got that. When we really don't. So many of us who've read the scriptures this past year, and we've been in the word, or a lot of you, you're like, man, I'm seeing things I've never seen before. This is when we start to see Jesus in ways we never have. Now, I'd say it this way. Our, our Christology then, our theology, determines our missiology. That's really the, the study of or what the church is doing, our mission. So it all recalibrates back to Jesus. What do we do as a church? We, we're informed by the person of Jesus. So we watch him. Again, we look at him. How did he relate to the lost? How did he care for people who are hurting? What was his political engagement like? How did he speak truth to power and to those in authority? We do the same. We're to live and do carry on the mission that he lived out for us. So we see him confronting injustices, caring for people who are hurting, and we do the same. So our mission pours out of the person of Jesus. I could say it this way. We really don't have a mission strategy or even, how about this, a mission department that we do. The whole church is a mission. Everybody's on mission. And we all live this way as missionaries. It was uh, Spurgeon who said every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. We're on mission, living out this Acts 1-8 mission that he's given to us. Many of us have been touched. Uh, I'll offer two examples because they're so close and tender to us right now. Many of us have been touched by Meg York's life. Uh, she passed away, not last week, but the, but the last that we, we celebrated her life. And we have celebrated her just life on mission every single day. As we talked about, just being a faithful presence right where God puts us. That's success for us. He, he, he says, go and wherever you go, love others and point them to me. That's living the Acts 1-8 mission. And, and I want you to know as a church family and have everyone's uh, attention here, I want us all to be praying for Bob Herrera. Bob is a longtime member of our church. He retired years ago, and for about 30 years, he has been serving, I mean, like as a staff member, volunteer in our benevolence ministries, in our mission efforts. We recently celebrated the naming of, uh, of a mission center, ministry center over in Vickery, uh, named after him. And I say this because uh, he's... He's struggling. His body is breaking down on him. And uh, we, we sought to get the most recent word today, but I just want us to be praying for Lucille. My heart breaks for her, for Jim and Brenda. Stacy and I were able to go and see Bob on Friday, pray with him. He knew we were there. But uh, I believe that he's going to be ushered in the presence of Jesus soon, very soon. So let's all be praying for Bob praying for the family. In fact, let's do that now. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that you would bless Bob, how, how we love him, how we've come to know you 
and seen him so much like you. Living out this Acts 1-8 mission in his life. We pray for comfort to come, even right now in the state he's in. May he know how much he's loved by you and by us. Fill him with his spirit. Fill Lucille, Jim, and Brenda, and the family. Lord, cover them with your power and your grace, your comfort right now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Friends, this Jesus, he's here. His, his spirit is in us. And he's filled us up to do the work he's called us to do. But I want you to see that not only does this, this theology, Christology, drive our missiology, it also drives then our ecclesiology. That's the, that, that is if to say, how do you do church? What are we supposed to do here? Oftentimes we get it backwards. And the church becomes a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of what Jesus originally intended us to be. Everything we do here, we must ask, how does it recalibrate back to the person and mission of Jesus, right? He's the head of the church. We have exciting days here. And while, I, while I'm talking to everybody in our church here, uh, I was with our students yesterday at Getaway Weekend. Praise God. We had about 18 kids that had come to faith in Christ, want to be baptized. It's amazing what's happening there. We're grateful to God for the leaders that God has placed here in our church. We've already talked about the coming of Han O oh, join our team and Rolando Aguirre join our team. And we're so thankful that God is at work in mighty ways among us. And I praise him for that. But I want to just challenge us. Everything we do, and we all have a part, we, everything we give to the Lord, all that we give to him through our giving is to propel the Acts 1-8 mission. And we have a lot to do, friends. We're a little bit behind right now. I'll just offer that. You can see it always in the bulletin. Full disclosure about where we are. We've got to step up as we move into the Easter season. We've got all kinds of things happening. VBS and youth camps and all that is coming. Uh, the Messiah to invite people to come to our church in the Easter season. And it's going to be a great one. But I want to encourage us all. Let's devote ourselves anew to the Acts 1-8 mission that he's called us to. The Great Commission. Because finally, look at this, this Jesus is coming again. We know he's come, we know he's here, but in verse 10, look at what it says. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, presumably angelic figures of some sort, and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, there it is, this Jesus. Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. That is to say, you guys are, you know, I would be saying, well, because we're looking up because we just saw, we just saw Jesus ascend into heaven. That's why we're looking up. He said, yeah, but, yeah, but move on because you got work to do. And by the way, he's coming again in the same way. You saw him. You're going to see him come again. And when he comes again, friends, I'm telling you, my eschatology tells me he could come any day. And when he comes again, it's closing time. It's game over. He will separate the sheep from the goats. He will bring heaven to earth and, and, his, and his prayer will be accomplished. The Father's will, his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as heaven and earth unite and we live forever on the new earth together. With him as Lord, when we see him, we're going to be changed by him. Do you know him? This Jesus has come. This Jesus is here. This Jesus is coming again. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in Jesus. We praise you that you are Lord of all. Lord, may we submit our lives to you today in every area of our life. Friend, let me ask you, how are you going to respond to this message? In what area of your life have you not allowed him to be Lord? Let him speak to your heart. Maybe it's in the workplace. Maybe it's in friendships or relationship. Maybe you need to forgive. You need to be open and honest. You need to recommit. Establish your covenant again with your spouse. Maybe it's your finances. Allow him to be Lord of your life. Because until 
that day comes when he comes again. We're to live on mission with him as Lord, master, and leader of our lives. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.